right. I want to want to finish a little bit of what we were reading, chapter 13, chapter 14, then we'll do the second uh, small group, large group, I guess. Take a break, and then we'll come back. Um, I left, and again, I, I, it's, it's my bad scroll, and, you, and not those of you on the wings can't see it, but I'm hoping you're seeing, you know what parody is? You know, if I try to imitate you, but I can't pull it off, that's parody. And in, in the story of Revelation, evil is a parody of good. So we have the dragon, the beast from the sea, the beast from the land. What does that seem to parody? The Trinity. The Trinity. <laughs> now the word Trinity hadn't been formed yet, but you, but you have a, a, a dominant force and two incarnations, okay? The one, the beast of the land, let's look at that, look at uh, verse 11. I saw another beast which rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. A lamb. When have we seen a lamb before? Huh? Yeah, who was that lamb? It's the Christ. Okay, so it's a parody. He exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Okay? So he also, he, he has, so he's, he's meant to, to be kind of an imitation of Christ. So th these, th this trio, this unholy trio, is meant to be a, a kind of a parody. They, they have power, so they have, they, have, uh, they have crowns and they have horns. So they, they, I mean, they in some ways are the alternative you know, to, to God and his Christ and his spirit, all right? I want to read to you the passage that you seem never to have remembered. And I just thought I, it was such a big deal to me, but back in, it would have been in October when I talked about uh, why, why is Mark so negative on the apostles? And, you know, why, why does Jesus hush them up? And I drew the picture, I can't base this, I don't know this for a fact, but tradition says that Mark was the interpreter of Peter. And tradition says Peter died in Rome. Uh, just before, around the period of, of Nero's persecution. That the church, as I imagined it, well, let me read the text, and then we'll, I'll, I'll continue. So Tacitus, T-A-C-I-T-U-S. He's a Roman historian. He's no friend. He's a second century. So he's looking back to the first century. He has no love for Nero. So he's talking about the fire, the great fire. And he writes, Consequently, to get rid of the report... Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, but the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Tacitus was kind of an upper class snob, huh? And he, he thought, Ro I mean, he was Roman, but he thought Roman had gone to the dogs, okay? He's writing in the second century, looking back to the first century. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted. See, I, I told you before, Romans, the Roman jurisprudence assumed that the only way to get the truth out of low-class people was to torture them. That upper-class people would tell you the truth, but slaves and, and groundlings would never, could never be trusted to tell the truth. So you had to torture them. Now, you torture me, I will tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I don't like pain. So near, they arrested some, 
and they confessed. Okay, and then, but but they, who else? Who else is a Christian with you? And they arrested them. And so it says, a great multitude. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of fiery in the city, as of hatred against mankind. I told you earlier that the Romans believed that you could have lots of religions in the empire as long as you also had, as a second religion, worship of the empire. And not to pray for the good of the empire is to hate the empire, to hate humankind. Okay? Okay, so, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Hence, even for criminals who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not, as it seemed, for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. So, the persecution, this is the first group persecution of Christians. It wasn't throughout the empire. It was throughout Rome, okay? And Nero is the, is the character behind it. Now, Nero did lots of other disgusting things. He started as a very bright, hopeful young man, but he got deranged. He really, he murdered his family. He, he I mean, he just, he, he and, and so in the end, the, 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 the soldiers revolted, but he committed suicide before they could get to him. So Nero, who is kind of infamous, huh? among Christians was also infamous among Romans. In the end, they hated him. They looked back at him as being kind of a just demonic, I won't use that word, but I use the word demonic kind of character. This appears then in many uh, apocalyptic works that Nero is going to come back. That is, he, was, he committed suicide, but rumor was maybe he ran away. And where, if you were a Roman, where would you run away to? Where would you be saved if you hated Rome? Parthia! <laughs> da, da, da. Okay, so all this kind of, so I want to read a little bit of what what's called for the Sibylline Oracles. They were a Jewish, um, a Jewish and then later on Christian apocalyptic writing, but they talk, they, they talk about, it talks about Nero, and Nero, again, he committed suicide, but nobody really saw it, so how do you know he would be dead? You know, that sort of thing. And as it happens, the Sibylline oracles also use the gematria. They use number, the letters that mean numbers. So I'll read a little bit of this. Um, after a long time, let's see. He will, he will have his first letter of 10. So they're, they're going down the line of, of emperors, and they're talking about, again, this, the Sibyl was like a prophetess who claimed to know the future. So she's speaking about what each of the emperors is going to do. Now, she's, I would propose to you, doing it in hindsight, okay? She's writing, this is being written in like second century, looking back, but it sounds like, oh my gosh, she knew so much, huh? So he, she's talking about an emperor whose first initial is, I got with E. E is, ah, Julius, 10, A, B, C, D, E. F G H I ten in 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 in, um, in Latin Roman numerals. The tenth letter in the Latin alphabet is I, as in Julius. Okay, so he will have his first letter of ten. So that after him will reign whoever obtained an, as initial the first of the alphabet. Who who reigned after Julius Caesar? Augustus. A is the first letter, huh? Okay, and then it goes on like this, blah, 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 blah. And then, um, then whoever, I'm skipping this, then whoever obtained an initial of three will rule. A, B, C. Huh? Caligula. There are some Roman historians here. Kudos for you. Next, a prince who will have twice ten as his first letter. Now, you'd have to know that's the letter K. Claudius, okay? But he will reach the furthest water of Oceanus, cleaving the tide under the Asoni. 
One who has 50 as an initial will be commander. 50 is the Roman, in order, not Roman numeral, but in order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and Nero. So here's what it says about Nero. One who has 50 as an initial will be commander, a terrible snake, breathing out grievous war, who one day will lay hands on his own family and slay them and throw everything into confusion, athlete, charioteer, murderer, one who dares 10,000 things. He will also cut the mountain between the two seas and defile it with gore. Nero tried to build a canal between the southern Greece, the Peloponnese, and the northern Greece. It didn't really work, but he, he was working on it. Uh, even when he disappears, he will be destructive. Then he will return, declaring himself equal to God. But he will prove that he is not. Three princes after him will perish at each other's hands. Again, if you know your Roman emperors, there's the year of the three emperors. Galba, Otho, Vitalius. So, so what you have here is a Jewish, not Christian, but a Jewish writing that uses both the idea of gematria, the numbers that signify a name, and speak about Nero as a wicked man who will come back. Here's it later in the same oracle. For the Persian will come unto your soil like hail. He will destroy your land of evil devising men with blood and corpses by terrible altars. All Asia, Asia Minor is the is the community or the area that's, that's being addressed here by John, falling to the ground will lament for the gifts she enjoyed from you when she wore a crown on her head. So they're, they're, they're talking about how uh, there was a great deal of emperor worship. Emperor worship was, if you wanted to get ahead, you know, if you weren't Roman, to get ahead, you, you pretended to be a Roman. And so the, the province of Asia, the cities, often would kind of suck up to the emperors to try to get good things from them. So there was this love-hate thing going on. The, 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 Asia, the Asians you know, wanted their independence, but they also wanted what Rome could provide. Um, so I just, I'm just reading a little bit of the Sibyl and Oracles just to, to knit together these issues that the characters, that what rep, what's happened in Revelation chapter 13 would be recognized. They didn't have to, they weren't like, wow, who could that be? They recognized all the tropes of, of who this character is, and that number of the beast is 666. They would sit down and work, oh, yeah, 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 it is Nero. I mean, it would, it would confirm what they already believed to be the case. All right? Chapter 14. Then I looked, and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So we immediately go from the negative trio, the evil trio, back to the lamb on Mount Zion with 144,000. Verse 4. It is these, the 144,000, who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are chaste. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Uh, like Mary, Mary had a lamb. Okay, but she, so these follow the lamb. And that reference to women, remember, it's a man's world, huh? And, the idea, and, and, they, and it's not that they were all celibates, I would argue, but that, again, ma again adultery is, a, is evidence of, inf of, of infidelity to God as well. So adultery is a metaphor for disloyalty to God, as you'll discover when we read Hosea. That's going to be part of your homework for September's class. Verse 8. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of her impure passion. I read this morning earlier uh, from First Peter how Babylon was a code word. Well, remember, Babylon started becoming a code word because it really had destroyed, it had destroyed the, the, the Jerusalem temple, the original temple. In Jeremiah 51 and 59, 
In Isaiah 21, there are dirges, laments over the Babylonian Empire. The prophets are looking for the day when God will finally defeat the forces that destroyed and exiled the Jews. And so, again, next year, we will read them. But guess what? Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great is a direct quote from Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now, again, in the Old Testament, it's the real Babylon that they want destroyed. Babylonians had destroyed the temple in the 6th century. But in Revelation, Babylon is a cover for Rome. And so this dirge that God is finally going to defeat our enemies. Verse 9. Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he, sh he also shall drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger. He shall be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image. So now the beast is, 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 really is an alternative to God. Here is God, the Son, and the Spirit. Here is the dragon, the beast of the sea, the beast from the land. Verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So periodically, the author will pause and give a little encouragement to his readers for patient endurance. Look at chapter 13, verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So even as he's describing these terrible images, he speaks to his faithful readers and encourages them for endurance. Remember again, what were the problems that the churches in chapters 2 and 3 were suffering from? Outside persecution and complacency and assimilation. assimilation. So what's the opposite? What's the virtue? When you have a vice, what you have to defeat it, you have to work or yeah, work the the, the opposing virtue. So let's say you're you're kind of selfish. Okay? You all want you. That's a vice. What's the opposite virtue? Charity. So you make yourself give away things because because your tendency is to keep it for yourself. You have to work the virtue that opposes the vice. So here, similarly, the 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 God the the readers are encouraged to to have patient endurance. There's a then there's a vision in the rest of the chapter, a double a double uh, vision of harvest. Um, in the, think of the Gospels. Jesus will use the image of harvest as a echo of the end of time, judgment. You, you cut the wheat, the wheat you, you bundle it in sheaves, you beat the grain out, you burn the straw, and you eat the grain. Huh? So it, it's a separation, it's a judgment. Think of the, we haven't read the parable of the weeds from the wheat yet, that's, that's that fourth year. But um, so th the rest of chapter 14 uses a double image, an image of a, a, an angelic harvester collecting sheaves of wheat and another angelic harvester plucking grapes. Look at verse 18, near the end. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. Its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trotting outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as horses' bridle for 1,600 stadia, which is like 200 miles. Okay? So it's a kind of a, a terrible, a terrible vision that he has of God's judgment. 
We're going to push through the chapter 15 before we do our small groups. Then I saw another portent in heaven. Great and wonderful, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. So how many sevens have we seen so far? How many cycles of seven have we seen? Well, name them. What was the, what was the first cycle of seven? Even before the seals. Seven churches, seven letters. Then seven seals. Then seven trumpets. And now seven bowls. Um, some interpreters try to count the visions in chapter 12 with the woman clothed with the sun and 13, the dragon and the beast as seven unnumbered visions. I don't know if it's necessary to do that. You're kind of reading back into it to make it so. But you've got plenty of sevens and then the seven bowls, all right? Um, Meanwhile, we're given a vision of heaven. Look at verse 2 of chapter 15. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. What's the song of Moses? Where you find it? Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Sing to the Lord, glossy triumphant, horse and rider, he's cast into the sea. So again, all the, throughout history, all the images of evil are piled on each other here because they all stand and they get their power from the dragon. Okay? In every age, there's a new incarnation. And so that's why the author goes back and forth and forth and back and drives you buggy. He's kind of trying to show off a little, I think. So uh, they sing this song of Moses. Now, again, they're back to heaven. In heaven, everything is orderly, neat, music, harmony, right? Um, but notice the thing is, is already there are victors, okay? Um, Okay, verse 2. Those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Who are those people who have conquered the image and the beast whose number is, we know? How do you conquer the beast? Which means what? They were willing to die for it. Now, I think you should know the word martyr is Greek and literally it means witness like in a courtroom your back's against the wall and they ask you what did you have what did you see what did I give testimony so think how many times there's been references to witness and testimony patient endurance that's what the author is prodding his readers to see they need to be remember again what the, you know, know what the problems are simulation okay Wimpiness, uh, external pressure, and the way you conquer the beast is by your testimony, and, be, and even to the point of death. He's preparing them to be ready for death, if need be. Okay, and again, think about Pharaoh, horse and chariot he has cast into the sea. In verse six, there are seven more angels that we were just introduced to. Uh, the seven bowls, but there is, then there is this, they come out in verse six, they come out again, and, uh, and uh, they begin to pour out the bowls on the earth. And again, what we have here is one of your, one of your homework questions, likened again, I asked you to look through chapter 16 and see how many references there are to the Plagues of Exodus. Look at verse 3. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea. It became like the blood of a dead man, and every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, we already did this in chapter 8. It's kind of redundant, but this is that repetition, like the Terminator, over and over and 
over. Okay, in verse eight, the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch men with fire. The seventh plague was the sun, and it led to fire on earth. Um, verse ten, the fifth angel pours his bowl, and the kingdom becomes dark. Darkness was one of the ten plagues. Verse thirteen. Oh, verse 12. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Parthia. And I saw issuing from the mouth of the dragon and from the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet three foul spirits like frogs. So there you get the demonic trio all lined up, okay? And he's called the prophet, too. So the beast in the land is also called the evil prophet, okay? Because he speaks a lot, all right? And um, where was I there? Verse 17. Oh, no, let's go back. Verse 16. They assembled them at the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. It's in the Greek, it's har Megiddo. Megiddo is, a, is, a, is an ancient city. It has like 25 or 30 layers in, in Israel. And it, it goes back to Pharaonic Egyptian times. And a lot of famous battles were fought there. And Har Ma, is mountain. Megiddo is the place where um, there will be an assembling of the nations for this final judgment. Huh? So that's where the idea of Armageddon comes from, okay? So this is that reference. The seventh angel pours his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. So those are the same words Jesus used on the cross. Was the author intentionally imitating Jesus' words, it is finished? Could be. Then there is earthquake and lightning. Verse 19, the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered great Babylon to make her drain the cup of the fury of his wrath, and every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, heavy as a hundredweight, dropped on men from heaven. Another one of the plagues from Egypt. Chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls, came and said, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters. Verse 3. He carried me away in spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns. What do we have there? A red, scarlet, heads, horns, it's, uh, it's an incarnation of the dragon, all right? The woman was arrayed in purple. And what does purple associate with? Royalty. Royalty and scarlet and bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication, her adulteries. And on her forehead was a written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Um, verse 8. The beast that you saw... Oh, I'm sorry. Here the angel kind of starts, steps up and gives some explanation. The beast... Well, let's read verse 7. The angel said to me, why marvel? I tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to behold the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Don't we use that for formula in we pray? You know, God who was who is and will be forever. Again, a, a, a parody, a parody. 
this beast was, was not, and will be again. Like Nero existed, committed suicide, and according to the Sibyl and Oracles, he's going to come back leading the Parthian army. Verse 9. Here, now, here is where the author begins to lay his cards on the table. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to perdition. Then there's reference to ten allies, without describing them. And then verse 15. He said to me, The waters that you saw where the harlot is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out the purpose of being of one mind and giving over their royal power to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, modern day literal interpreters of this book see a phrase like that and they've got to come up with what could that possibly be? Back in the days of the late great planet Earth, those of you who read that back in the 70s, the only thing that seemed to, to fit the bill was the common market. Remember the common market? It had 10 nations, <gasps> like the 10. Okay, but now the, the common market is gone. You have the EU instead. It's kind of like, it's kind of like big and blown up. So that's, again, the problem of identifying, oh, it's this, it's this, is things don't, history does not stand still. But what, for the original authors, what, what is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth? in the first century, Rome. Rome, okay? So again, if you read it in its context versus trying to just imagine what, you know, what we want it to be, somebody asked me, how come Protestants think the beast is associated with, with the church? Well, <laughs> because the book really is talking about Rome, pagan Rome. But if you are a Protestant, what is one of the things that you hold against the Catholic Church? Think back, 16th century, is the, the church persecuted Protestants. I mean, they, burned, they we fought each other. Catholics burned Lutherans, Lutherans burned Catholics, they both burned free church people. And, and remember the reference to how the, the beast wants to destroy the saints? So they read this, they read this, and they said, well, it's the church. It's the Catholic church. Rome, destroying the saints. Uh, so that's where that comes from. Okay, the, and, and once they see it, they read everything to make it fit that way. Again, if you look at the Charles Miller poster, you know, it's, it's Rome. It's, it's the Catholic church. Because we're from Rome, and we were the opposition, remember? And we were seen as being, I mean... Luther and company didn't leave the church on happy terms. Huh? You know, Luther called the Pope the Antichrist. The, the, the Pope called Luther the Antichrist. I mean, they, they did it back and forth. Huh? So, but what, what they had done is they were reading this book as about their day. And I'm trying to tell you, the book is initially about first century, and it's about every day. Comments, questions. None. This is complete sense to you. Ah. I think not. Well, you just don't know how to form a question. Right? Well, again, there's a lot going. I mean, we, I, I was talking at lunch. You know, you really should read it over again. It's a very long book, I get that. It's very boring when you start seeing, oh my God, here we go again, and here we go again. It's intentionally boring. 
Like the Terminator film, it's intentionally boring. Evil is persistent. And that means we who fight it must be more than persistent. And so there's a kind of like repetitiveness, but because that's the nature of it. You see the thing about, um, it said that the kings will, will, the 10 kings who are its allies will turn on the woman. What's that about? That's the nature of evil. It consumes itself. You know, think about, about uh, groups of thieves, you know, and then when one person is, the, is, is top dog, and then when he gets eliminated, then they, they, who's going to be next top, you know? The, in the end, evil can't be kiss and make up. They have to, you know, evil by its very nature consumes itself. And so in his writings here, he says that the ten allied kings will attack, will attack the beast, or the woman who rides the beast, okay? Do you need a break, or can we go right into the second small group? Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I I guess I kind of thought you would do that. Oh, yeah. I would read it again with because Kester cut past the first couple chapters to where because because then he'll he'll talk about chapters one and two, chapter three and four, mm -hmm. and just read it along as a commentary. It's a commentary. It's meant to be read with the text. Then go back and read the introduction again, or the first part of it. Okay? Well, let's, let's just push through and do the small group. Um, you can turn this off. Then we'll take a longer break, and then come back for the last push. Do you want me to record the small group? No, 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 no. Okay. You, if you're not here, you lose. <laughs>